So we're in the wilderness still. We're going to be in the wilderness for a couple of more weeks until we get to Easter. But we're on this journey to wilderness, through the wilderness. And and we've discovered some things about the wilderness. We've discovered, for example, repeat after me, the wilderness is is scary. scary. Now, you didn't say it like it was very frightening, (laughs) but you get it. So the wilderness is a scary place. Repeat after me. The wilderness is is a lonely place. place. Even sometimes in the midst of hundreds and hundreds of people. You see, I was thinking about that. Some of the most lonely times in my life have been when I've been surrounded by lots and lots of people. And I wonder if that isn't true for all of us at some point in our lives. The wilderness is one of those places where, um, quite frankly, God seems to speak to us. All through Scripture, the Bible has episodes where his servants go to the wilderness and God speaks there. Moses and Noah and Jacob and Isaiah and Amos all spent time in the wilderness. Ezekiel and Elijah spent time in the wilderness. Job spent time in the wilderness. And and Jesus spent time in the wilderness. And each time and in each sense, there in the wilderness, God spoke so that people could hear And so that the people could benefit from that that experience. So the wilderness, even though it's lonely and possibly scary and maybe dry and maybe rocky and barren, is a place that really the church needs to see and understand. Last week we talked about how it was in the wilderness that we met some beasts. They're all around. And we talked about how in and around our lives there are beasts at every turn. There's fear. There's temptation. There's despair. There's hunger and thirst. These are all the beasts that we seem to have around us all of the time, just waiting to nip at our heels, to distract us from our mission, to keep us from being all that God has called us and equipped us to be. We spoke last week that the wilderness is that place where if we are to survive, we need to focus on the will of God, which is found in the word of God, which shows us the way of God. Wilderness time is a time, if we want to be really true to it, is a time where we must learn to focus on and become dependent fully and wholly on God and God alone. Wilderness time is that time of complete dependence on God, which quite frankly is different than most of our lives. Because if we are to be truly honest, most of the time we are dependent on God only when it becomes a necessity. How many of you have ever heard someone say, well, there's nothing else to do, so I guess I'll pray. And I'm always concerned about that. Because if we wait until prayer is our last resort then we've waited too long. One of my favorite stories about this happened in a church that I was the pastor. And and I told this story in the first service and, and all of the financial guys got really excited because I was talking about money. I had a church that was going broke. 
Just so you know, most churches are going broke. They're supposed to. But that's a whole other sermon. But they were so broke that they were looking at not being able to pay a month's worth or two months of bills. They didn't have a reserve to fall back on, and and they were struggling day in and day out to meet payroll and and to pay the electric bill and, and to buy the Sunday school curriculum and to do all the things that churches have to do. So we finally had a meeting. You know, that's what happens when churches can't decide what they really need to do. They have a meeting. And we had this meeting, and we were talking about how desperately we were in need of money. Finally, one of the sweet little old saints raised her hand and said, I think it's time to pray. And one of the not-so-old saints says, Yep, it's time of last resort, so we better pray. And that's when the sledgehammer hit me in the temple. Because when we wait for prayer to be our last resort, it's too late. So I called a prayer meeting. We had Sunday school coming up the next week, and so we had an all-church prayer meeting. And we decided we were going to pray about money and about the church's need. And we started out with giving praises for all the ministry that the church had been able to do for over 100 years. We gave praises for this ministry and that ministry, and then we began to pray about how we were going to continue and how we were going to how we were going to be able to survive the current financial crisis that we were in. And we were praying and praying and 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 I noticed that the, the treasurer left the prayer meeting. That concerned me just a little. <laughs> but he came back, but in his hands, he brought back a stack of bills. And he came up and he whispered in my ear as we were praying about other things. He says, look, I have brought all of the bills that are either currently due or past due. And I wanted to say, what do you want me to do with them? Throw them up to God? And he said, yes. So I took the bills. I said, do you know how much we owe? He says, well, I added it up. It's $7,983.27. I remember the 27 cents like it was yesterday. So I said, here are the bills. Dear God, we need that much money. So we prayed. By the time we left Sunday school to go and get ready for church, we had paid every single bill. Somebody says, well, what's this bill? They wrote a check. They said, what's this bill? Somebody else wrote a check. They got to the electric bill. Two people wrote checks. You all know electric bills can be high in churches. And as I watched what that church did, they were changed. And from that point on in that church's life, for at least as long as I was the pastor, we prayed about money. And we prayed about how God was going to bless us to do the mission and ministry of the church. And as long as I was the pastor of that church, money was never an issue. It wasn't because of me. It's because we learn to pray, not as a last resort, but as a first act of faith. I'm telling that story 
Because that church was in the wilderness. If you've ever been broke, if you've ever been destitute, if you've ever been poor, you know what the wilderness is like. And I'm pretty sure that most of us who have been there would do just about anything not to go back. Think about the wilderness with me. When the people of God were in the Sinai wilderness wandering around on their 40-day journey that took 40 years to get from Egypt to the Promised Land, what did God do? God provided for them every single day. Every day there was a new delivery of manna. Every day there was new water, new quail, new this, new that. Every day God took care of them. Now God could have sent them enough manna for the whole trip, but then they'd had to carry it. God could have only let them walk along the streams, except there were none on that journey. Every day, the people of God, as they traveled, learned to trust God to act every day. In fact, their trust of God became their habit of faith. And that's how we're called to live. I always love the Lord's Prayer. How many of you love it when we sing the Lord's Prayer at the end of the service? Do you ever listen to those words? The ones that come to my mind at this point are these. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not a prayer for our bread three weeks from now. It's not bread a month from now. It's today. For that is how God meets our needs each and every day. I remember there was one man and his family in a church a long time ago. They had two children. Well, they had three children, two boys, and then a a young daughter that was fairly severely handicapped. And everything was all right until he lost his job. When he lost his job, he lost his income. And When they lost their income, they were in danger of losing their house and they were in danger of not having enough to eat. And he was telling me one day, he says, it was during this time he learned to pray the Lord's Prayer in a different manner. For he says, I learned that line, give us this day our daily bread. And it had real meaning to me. Because how how many of us in this room are going to go home to a freezer that's full? Most of us, when we go home, have several days that we could survive. And this man says, I wasn't necessarily sure where the next meal was coming from. But he says, God provided. He says, God provided through a church that kept bringing meals to us, that kept somehow paying my electric bill, that kept taking action so we could stay together as a family. He says, in the 18 months that I was without a job, we never missed a doctor's appointment for my child. Even in the four months, we didn't have a car. Each day was a new day, he says. And each day, God acted. God met our needs. He says, when we were in the wilderness, we didn't know exactly which direction to turn, but God did. God gives us what we need in our wilderness. I I, I try to talk about that, and I try to talk about the wilderness as a place that's not a terrible place. It's just not necessarily the best place, unless you're waiting to hear from God. Bible's full of images 
that I think can help us here. The Bible is full of images that can call to mind our need to be dependent upon God. And so I have three images for you to consider today. Images that I would put before you and ask you to consider being like or being a part of. My first image is of Jesus the Good Shepherd. God is characterized in Scripture again and again as a shepherd. Jesus referred to himself multiple times as the Good Shepherd. Scripture constantly characterizes the people, you and I, not as the shepherd necessarily, but as the sheep. Now, how many of you have ever been around sheep just a little bit? If you haven't been around sheep, you need to go spend some time with sheep. You will understand why the Bible calls us that. Because anybody who's ever been around sheep knows that there are some things about sheep that quite frankly might remind you of some of us. For example, sheep oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, smell bad. Any of you experience that? Sheep are also not the smartest critters in the corral. Sheep will eat themselves off of a cliff or off of a dock into a pond. Sheep are, because of the way their breeding has happened over the last two or three or four or five hundred years, can't defend themselves against anybody. Their weird little feet and legs and their 400 pounds of fur keep them from being able to swim. Well, their fur isn't 400 pounds till it gets wet and then it's anchors away right to the bottom. Any of you get in the picture that Jesus was trying to depict for us here? How many of you are just not real happy with Jesus at this point, saying that we're like sheep? But it's true. I learned a long time ago that just because I don't like some of the things God says doesn't mean that they aren't true. Any of you else have that problem? Sheep are completely dependent on their shepherd for survival. Completely. Sheep without a shepherd are just fair game for every, every wild animal that wants to come after them. I had one shepherd friend who says, yeah, most of my sheep couldn't, could, couldn't um, get themselves out of a wet paper bag. Says a good ferocious squirrel would kill them. Now, I tell you this because sheep, because they're completely dependent on the shepherd, and Jesus says, we're sheep, and we're completely dependent on the shepherd. This is an important image, because most of us in this room have been, is it not true, taught that being dependent is bad. How many of you have been taught that being dependent is bad? You see, I've gotten lots of hours of counseling. I know what it means to be codependent and primarily dependent and dependent for this and dependent for that. And every time I hear that, I know those are bad things. But Jesus says, be dependent on me. The Lord's Prayer says, we are dependent on God. And when we live dependent on God, Our lives are changed. Our lives are blessed. Because we don't have to worry about the enemy. We don't have to worry about the evil that surrounds us. Because we are habitually dependent upon God. Now the second image I have for you is this really cool picture. 
Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Now, some of you world travelers may have been to this place. This picture is a picture of the grape vine, and I said grape vine, because everything you see there is part of one grape vine at Hampton Court Palace just outside of London, England. This vine was planted in 1768. Some of its branches are 200 feet long. Its single root, which is where we're standing, we're standing in the picture next to the root, is over two feet thick. Because of skillful cutting and pruning, this one vine produces over 600 pounds of grapes a year. Even the vines farthest from the root, some over 200, between 200 and 220 feet away, are producing fruit every year. And the vine gets longer and bigger every year. Jesus says, we are the branches. We're not the root. We're the branches. We're the part out there growing. We're the part out there bearing fruit. But we're only doing that if we are connected to the root who is Jesus. If we're not connected to Jesus, then we're not bearing fruit. At least not for him. More importantly... Not only are we not bearing fruit, but if we aren't connected to Jesus, then we're not drawing life from him either. Because the branch furthest away from the root in that picture, if it's not connected to the root, it will wither and die. As will we, if we're not connected to the root. The third image for us today is the image of the high priest. It's what we talked about in Hebrews chapter 4. I'll be honest, this author teaches us that Christ is our great high priest. He teaches us that each one of us has a high priest that, that sole function is to be the intermediary between God and us. Now, I will tell you that in most Protestant congregations, including this one, we don't think about high priest very often because we believe in the priesthood of all believers, which means that we can all go stand before God and plead our case. And we do, and that's right. But what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is that as we plead our case before God, we are not alone. There is still yet the high priest pleading for you and for me, pleading for our salvation, pleading for the salvation of people around us, pleading for the goodness of God to be experienced by more than just a few. This author says, and this is one of my favorite lines in all scriptures, is because we have this high priest we can approach the throne of God with boldness. We don't have to sneak up to it. We don't have to just whisper to God saying, Oh God, what about me? We can say, Lord, here I am. I come to bow before you. Receive me. And he will. This author in Hebrews says, the great thing about our high priest is he's been through it all with us. He's faced every temptation. He's stood every trial. And he's won. He's won the battle. He understands what we've been through. He knows what it means to be poor. He knows what it means to be hated. He knows what it means to be loved. 
few years ago, there was an article written in, it was a multiple of articles, it was a series about a, a reporter who decided to go be homeless so he could report about it. And, and he found out that being homeless wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. He says, and it wasn't the obvious things that being homeless poses that were the biggest detriments to his spirit. It was because, he says, the biggest detriment is that if you're homeless, you're unseen. If you're homeless, you're not seen as a valued part of the community. If you're homeless, you're not seen as someone with something to offer. If you're homeless, he says, most of the time, you're not seen at all. As he wrote about this and as he experienced what it meant to be homeless, he, 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 he began to understand even more deeply some of the things that Jesus was talking about when he was saying things like feed the hungry, give to the poor, bring water to the thirsty. Because Jesus did it. In the wilderness times, in times of our greatest needs, we need to let our focus and our habit be to depend on God. For when we depend on God, that's where our strength comes from. There's a boy and his father who were out walking along a road one day. And they came across this large stone. The little boy said to his dad, Do you think if I use all my strength, Dad, I can move that rock? His father answered, If you use all of your strength, I am sure you can do it. So the little boy set to work, and he got up close to that rock, and he lifted, and he tugged, and he pulled, and the rock never moved. He pushed it, and he kicked it, and he worked up a sweat, and he worked and worked, and that rock never moved. The boy began to be discouraged, and he finally turned to his dad, and he says, Dad, you were wrong. I can't do it. I can't move it. The father placed his arm around the boy's shoulder and said, No, son. Remember, I told you to use all of your strength, and you haven't. Because you haven't asked me to help you. Wilderness is a time when we have to choose who we are dependent on. Will it be ourselves or will it be our God?